Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to be here and hosting this panel today. Uh, my name is Gautam Shah, and I'm the founder of Internet of Elephants, a company that uses scientific data to create digital experiences about wildlife to try and engage massive audiences with its conservation. Now, when I started this company about four years ago, this panel would have been, a very, would have been very hard to put together. Um, while games, of course, have been around forever, the idea that they could be a powerful tool for wildlife storytelling was hardly discussed. Um, but I think more and more of the conservation and storytelling sectors are finding it hard to ignore the massive appeal and reach that games have. I think we're nearing, nearing almost 3 billion players across geographies, age groups, and wealth classes. So our panel today brings expertise in behavioral psychology, nature documentary filmmaking, and impact game development. And we'll be discussing if and how games could become the next big thing in impact storytelling for nature. I'd like to let each of our panelists introduce themselves and then we'll just jump right back in. We'll just jump right in. Um, Alan, can we start with you? Sure, I'm Alan Gershenfeld. I'm co-founder and president of Eline Media. We're a developer and publisher of commercial social impact games that help players understand and shape the world. Previously, I was chairman of Games for Change, and before that, I ran Activision Studios, a big commercial game company. Super. And Vanessa? Hi, I'm Vanessa Belowitz. I'm a co-founder of Wildstar Films and also an executive producer on a number of wildlife series that we're currently producing for a range of clients. Um, I've worked in natural history filmmaking for 30 years and worked on many of uh, the sort of wildlife a series that you may have heard of, like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, and um, and continuing to enjoy, continuing to enjoy producing wildlife films today. Excellent, thank you. And Renee, hi, uh, my name is Renee Lertzman, and I'm a psychologist and strategist, and I've spent my career really looking at the intersection of environmental and conservation communication and psychology, and really uh, exploring how can we design context that really enable people to engage with the issues facing us on our planet um, in as constructive and proactive a way as possible. Uh, I also have a project, uh, Project Inside Out, funded by the KR Foundation, which is launching in a few weeks that is producing tools and resources grounded in psychological research, neuroscience, cognitive science for the climate sustainability sectors and practitioners. Amazing. It's fabulous to have all three of you on the panel here today. Um, I'm, I'm very, very excited about having this conversation with everybody. And, you know, I'd like to start with a little foundation on how people feel when we communicate difficult topics with them. Um, Renee, you've been so influential to our work, um, and a lot of a lot of that is brought out beautifully in your in your TED talk. Could you tell us a little bit more about what makes the environment and conservation such a difficult topic for people? Mm, right. So, um, so basically, environmental conservation issues are what I would consider to be just a wickedly complicated um, terrain to be in from a psychosocial perspective um, and also on many other levels, but particularly psychologically. Um, these issues are complex for a number of reasons, including the very, um, what I refer to in my TED talk as messy and complicated feelings, which is often a combination of, of shock, of guilt, um, could be some shame in the mix, could be fear, um, overwhelm, as well as coexisting with a very intense desire that we have as humans to solve problems. And so when we're confronted with these issues and the scale of them, they can evoke very complicated, very, um, uh, you know, uh, experiences that people may not know how to navigate very well. Um, and that it, it's that confluence of okay, I'm apprehending the issue, I'm learning about what's happening, it's evoking in me this, this complicated response, including what do I do, how do I respond, what does this mean for me? And when there's an absence or a lack of coherent um, response, you know, ability to channel that, which is <clears throat> how to engage and 
maybe with an organization or what can I do, we can short circuit we can actually sort of cut ourselves off from our own care and concern about what's happening. And that's what shows up as a sort of disconnection, a sort of paralysis, what people working in the conservation sectors would label as apathy or would label as people don't care, people aren't motivated. And from a psychological perspective, that's actually not accurate and it's not coherent, that there's a lot more going on in terms of how we are depending on who we are and where we are in our context, protecting ourselves and managing the very um, complicated feelings and experiences that come up for us. And so, you know, the implications for anyone working in the conservation sector, including filmmakers, communicators, game developers, and so on, the, the, the responsibility I would say is to be exceptionally mindful of how can you and we partner with people how can we show up as partners to say, here's what's going on. It's very intense. It's very overwhelming to demonstrate the empathy, to say, look, this might bring up anxiety, ambivalence, and your aspirations. How can we work together to address what's happening? So it's that empathy piece that's unbelievably important. Yeah, I mean, what you, what you say hits home even for me. I mean, I I consider myself a conservationist and somebody who works in the sector and I have those feelings every day. I mean, when I see the, the photographs now of San Francisco and the wildflowers, wildflower fires, I just shut down. I mean, I just don't, you know, I just don't know what, you know, what I can do about it. So, I mean, I, I just imagine that that's the case for, for so many people. Um, what, do, what do you think are some of the common mistakes that, you know, that our sector makes when we're trying to communicate these difficult these difficult topics, mm -hmm. well, whether it be climate change or wildfires, or you know, now we've seen another report on the catastrophic decline of wildlife that's come out. Like, what are the what are the what are the common mistakes that we're making? Right. Well, anyone working to produce communication, education, engagement platforms is facing unbelievable dilemmas. And I have a lot of compassion for the challenges that you all find yourselves in, which is how do you communicate and convey what's happening um, in a way that evokes and arouses the kinds of, um, you know, emotional cognitive responses that we're wanting, which is care and concern and also the, the quote, activation. Um, and so what I see common pitfalls, understandably, but very, very pervasive, is that a lot of media tends to uh, default unintentionally into a binary of what I would call the awe and wonder uh, genre to really hit home like, oh, let's evoke the love and the wonder and the sense of connection with the natural world, with the animals, with the species, with the biodiversity. And there's an assumption that if we evoke the love and the wonder and the awe, it's somehow going to magically translate into how we work through that into what it means for us in the messy and complicated political, social, and cultural context that we're dealing with. So there's the awe and wonder and, also, and, and the cheerleading, which is let's keep this positive and very aspirational and we don't wanna bum you out, we don't wanna make you depressed and yet, you know, and then the, the other side of the binary is this is what's happening, graphic, shocking, you know, we've got to show you what's actually going on. And I noticed that it's that, you know, we can look at many examples like planet Earth that have, um, you know, tried to navigate this as graciously and nuanced way as possible, which is I was incredibly aware watching planet Earth at the time I was living in the UK and watching it come out on the TV. And I knowing what I know and being in the field I'm in, I was projecting all that I know about the, the loss, the threat and the vulnerability into my experience, even though it wasn't being explicitly referenced. And I imagine that was happening for a lot of us that even if the filmmaker isn't naming it, we're bringing that in because the cat is out of the bag. Like we know what's going on. You'd have to be under a friggin' rock to not know what the heck is going on. So we choose, we're not gonna go there, but the view, we're bringing that in. So there's the, you know, and then they, they had the pieces at the end where it's like, okay, let's get down to what's really going on. And we're going to talk about how incredibly vulnerable and threatened all of this life. We've just evoked all this love and wonder from you. Now we're going to tell you what's really happening, which is that it's very th threatened. So there's this, this, this real um, toggle that's going on, which 
is not helpful psychologically because it reinforces a, a splitting in, in you know, the psychological world. There's the terminology of splitting or dissociation where we kind of split ourselves off. And so unintentionally as communicators and educators, we're reifying the splitting. And the way forward, you know, which which we'll get into obviously in this panel is how do we how do we touch on all these various notes without the splitting? How do we be more integrated in our storytelling so that we can acknowledge this is painful and hard and we're in this together and here's what's happening, you know, to, to weave, it's almost like weaving these threads together, which I think is is really tricky as a storyteller, but um, but a way through that that dilemma. So and I'm very aware that, you know, we have Vanessa here who has been on the front lines of navigating exactly these kinds of dilemmas. So I would love to hear, you know, Vanessa, what, what, what have your challenges been? You know, how have you navigated these, these tensions? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I echo everything that you've, your analysis of uh, the journey that I feel myself and my fellow filmmakers have been on is absolutely right. Um, you know, at the start of the journey, we were very much trying to focus on promoting awe and wonder because it felt like there was still a lot of um, people around us who are very disconnected from nature and just simply don't have access to the awe and wonder of the natural world. So that felt like a really important job. Um, simultaneously, we're all passionate environmentalists and conservationists ourselves. You know, we are like you, we're sitting there going, but there's the whole context in which, you know, these animals are existing that is, you know, desperate in many uh, cases that we need to convey in our storytelling. And when we did that, um, we tended to, as you say, go to the other extreme and it was all doom and gloom um, and audiences switched off. So when, then we started to think we need to start to integrate it into the awe and wonder and planet Earth, we would have, you know, one sequence per show. I mean, it's, I'm shocked to say that, that was 2006. And we felt that was all the sort of window of tolerance was for our audiences that they could cope with. Um, and, you know, we'd have something that would suggest that we had a, a, one of my shows, we had a polar bear that was killed by a walrus because it was through climate change having to take on very difficult, unusual prey. And we used that as a sort of metaphor and it was all very gentle and nuanced. And then, as you say, there was the show at the end where you suddenly we said, actually, everything's now on thin ice. Um, this is much more desperate. Uh, but at, over time, we've realized, and I think that the audience is, needs this, they need to know this, and we have to work harder as storytellers to integrate it into the actual main story of the shows. And I think where we're starting to realize our real strength is as wildlife filmmakers is to use that incredible ability to connect audiences to the animal characters. And we're starting to feed the issues into their stories. And that feels probably the most effective way of doing it because as you say, it's becoming more integrated so that the, the audience is carried along by the story of the environment and the animal and is connecting emotionally, but at the same time also thinking about the issue and the reality of the landscapes that these animals are existing in. Right, and I think that, I think the dilemma, um, you know, having worked with environmental communicators for many years now, um, and teaching courses that allow me to kind of explore these dilemmas more closely. I, I feel like there's what I would think of as a golden trine where you've got the information, like, you know, how much information can we share without triggering the uh, defense mechanisms? You know, triggering the, I can't, that's outside of my window of tolerance, as you just said, I can't go there. You know, I literally walked out of the room last night watching PBS when I heard the newcaster say, so a new report by WWF has just revealed that there's now, you know, dramatic loss, 70%. I just literally walked out of the room. I was just like, this is pushing me out of my window of tolerance yes. and I can't handle it. So how do you all then walk that line where you, you know, you, you, you connect the dots without defaulting into the, okay, and now, you know, the storytelling, the I mean, cheerleading. I think there's been some good examples where we've got it right. And I think Blue Planet 2, um, I think they call it even now the Blue Planet effect, um, was a, a moment in time where the storytelling really came together. 
Um, so they created the awe and the wonder and the emotional character building and world building. Uh, and then into that story came a moment with a pilot whale mother carrying around her calf who'd been poisoned by her milk through plastics in the, in the ocean. And it had huge impact. It was discussed in parliament. Um, it was connected up with sort of the blue belt charter. Um, everyone was talking about it at policy level. I think there was a kind of real surge in awareness, um, certainly in the UK, where people were like, we need to do something about this. And I believe there was some kind of then direct uh, conversion into action there. People were going online. There was much more kind of connection to campaigns. Um, so something that we did there was right as a community. And, and I, I think it was, as you say, it's that getting the right balance of the emotional storytelling with sufficient facts and context that you capture people and, and make them feel empowered to uh, seek change and change their behavior rather than just going, I can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, oh, go ahead, Gotcha. Sorry, Renee, I, I want to bring Alan into the, I, I, I could talk about this, topic and you know just this in particular and we've talked about it at, at length and you know in terms of some of our work but I definitely want to bring Alan into the conversation here and start to bring in the the, the texture of games and the possibility and then I want to hear back from you Renee on some of the things that we could be doing um, but yeah Alan I mean I think it would be great if you could talk a little bit about what what makes games so you know what makes games so popular what what is the game sector getting right uh, that makes them so I mean I, that makes them so popular yeah, at the highest level, um, what makes games different than linear media like movies or television or books, they're lean forward, not lean back. Uh, players, they're interactive. Players have agency. So in games, players can take on roles and identities rather than just observe them. They take on the role, of that role or identity. Um, they have agency to make decisions to act, games are about verbs. People often think about the action verbs, but there's a lot of thinking verbs in games. When, when they act individually and off, often collectively, so games are social, and um, that's gonna be an interesting thread. Um, when they act, crucially, they get feedback. They get feedback from the game system itself, the technology, but they also get feedback from peers, from mentors, from the community. And uh, they fail most of the time, but the failure is fun. Uh, and as they fail and get feedback, they level up towards whatever goals the game designers had. So, you know, every medium has different affordances and weaknesses when it comes to impact and change, but those are very powerful affordances. Um, one can get even deeper in that uh, in the game industry, you have games as product, which are games you play and finish that often have a narrative arc and often a rich narrative arc, not, not often as rich as movies or novels, but still getting richer and richer. But you also have games as service, which don't end. Uh, games like Minecraft or Roblox or World of Warcraft. Um, these are games where you, you, you basically continue to play um, for as long as the game designer and community can thrive. And this is a very powerful uh, sort of landscape for impact because in a game as a service, you optimize for engagement, deeper engagement, you optimize for financial returns, but there's no reason why you couldn't optimize for impact as well. Um, so those are just some of the very powerful differences and affordances. And you've, you just touched upon it, but you've spent a great deal of your career as a, as a leader in how games can be used to influence change, not necessarily within the conservation sector, but, but, in, but in many different sectors. Can you tell us some of the reasons you think games could potentially be an agent of change um, and, you know, and address some of the challenges that, that Renee's laid out earlier in the, in the conversation? Yeah, I mean, one, one caveat to begin with, um, the, much like uh, the wildlife documentaries, this is a craft, not a commodity. I mean, mm -hmm. just because it's a game doesn't mean it's fun. Just mm -hmm. because it's an impactful game doesn't mean it's impactful. It, it's a very difficult craft. Game designers, um, and it's a younger craft. You know, we it's a relatively young industry. We're still learning a lot about just the, the core industry, let alone the impact side of it. The other thing is it's actually many different um, genres, platforms, engagement loops. And, and that's important to know. What the, the experience of a mobile social game versus uh, a deep console or VR game um, 
the difference. I mean, there's just many different genres. There's many different business models. There's many different contexts of implementation in the impact in people researching impact games. And that, that is now a sector that's been on for about a decade or two. Often it's, it's, it's what happens around the game where the deepest impact is. So if it's an educational based game, it's the interaction between the teachers and the students where, where there's deep impact and feedback and reflection. Um, even in consumer games, especially social games, it's the conversations around the games. So th there, there are a lot of different approaches to impact within games, but it's important to understand the context the goals, the stakeholder goals for impact. Are you are you trying to provide awareness and a stepping stone to get somebody more interested? Where they didn't wake up interested in a topic, but after they played the game and immersed themselves in it, now they're interested and it's a stepping stone. Or are you trying to get people that are committed to go deeper, where you're actually putting engagement loops in the game, say citizen science or donation or actually behavior change, where you can't advance in the game unless you do that outside the game. These are different theories of change. These are different theories of impact. And, you know, I think they touch on different um, elements of what Renee talked about. It's not that you can tackle all of them in every game, but you can tackle elements of them. Do you have um, an example of something you've worked on or something that you admire that you think was very successful in, in its impact goal? Yeah, I mean, th th there are examples in, in each of the areas that, that I've talked about. I'll just run through a, a bunch of different ones, and then I'll talk about one or two that we've done. Um, so there was a really interesting, th there's a, a massive multiplayer game called EVE Online, where they actually integrated citizen science. A separate company came in and worked with that game platform. And often these, these games have tens, sometimes hundreds of millions of users. And so that's really fascinating. And they integrated C citizen science into the game loop. And so that was a really powerful way to get uh, gamers who weren't necessarily thinking about citizen science into citizen science, but they really made the organic alignment between the game loop. There's, there's games, like we worked on a game a while ago called Half the Sky with Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Ludun, who had a, a best-selling book by the same name, where, we, where, where donations were part of the game loop. Um, and you could actually track the number of people who donated towards empowering women and girls in, in the developing world as part of that theory of change. There's a game called Remission for Kids with Cancer, where, where kids went, uh, sort of took on, went into the body and fought their cancer. And there's a lot of health research that says if you have an engaged patient who's engaged in their illness they're, and their doctor, they become more engaged, especially kids. And they actually shown the health outcomes. There's even game-based medicine and therapeutics that's going through FDA trials. I, I mentioned all of these just to sort of mention the range of, of, mm -hmm. of topics, you know, there's a Gina Davis has a nonprofit, the actor, actress Gina Davis, called C. Jane, where she studies how how roles, gender roles, uh, uh, work in media. And often, uh, if you see somebody who looks like you in a certain role, you may aspire to become that. Uh, and there's a lot of good research on that. So we think a lot about who you play in the game and what they look like, and because we know that will inspire young players into certain career paths. And there's really good research to back this up. These are all various impacts, but they're different impacts. Um, we did a game with an Alaska Native tribe where they, uh, a, an Alaska Native tribal organization called the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, their culture had been um, often co-opted or misrepresented in, pos in, in popular media. They wanted to share and celebrate their culture from their own voice to a global audience. So we, 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 we spent a lot of time doing an inclusive development process with them. We did a game based on a story passed down for thousands of years in the Inupiat language. And it's touched a nerve. We've had millions of players. We've won lots of awards. We've had uh, hun you know, hundreds of millions of hours of awareness. Um, but one of the things we did, I think relevant to this audience is we embedded 26 documentaries about the Alaska Native people. It was a puzzle platform game, uh, a classic game genre, but uh, we then unlocked short documentaries so you could meet the people themselves. Uh, that led the BBC to contacting us. Uh, you referenced Blue Planet 2. Uh, they contacted us and said, would you build an exploration game? We have all this amazing footage from five years of shooting this film. Would you build an exploration game where the player can take on the identity of a marine scientist, a marine explorer, an aquanaut? Um, and as you play the game, we unlock the Ocean Insights, which includes some amazing footage that didn't make it into the documentary. And so that mix of modalities is very, very powerful. In fact, I think we can show a trailer and even some of the insights to get a sense of how you can mix powerful uh, wildlife documentaries with powerful games with agency.
Welcome to the Western Pacific. I'm Dr. Mirai Soto, and I'll be your eyes and ears on this expedition. I'm joined today by two colleagues. Hello, I'm Andre. And I'm Irina. First time on a live stream. Be gentle with her. That's close enough. You can use your dive water to control the boy from there. I'm scanning to train our AI to recognize sperm whales, and so we can hopefully recognize our specific friend later. Hello, Marai. Thanks for checking in. Feeling settled in the sun? I'm great. Nice suit, nice sub. This solo subtest makes me nervous. We're definitely fitting it out for two pilots next time. Didn't you help design it? Yes, but now you're driving it. Well, you don't see that every day. At least I don't. Neither do I. Looking good, Mirai. The Manta drone is ready for its first zoom scan. All right, baby. We won't forget you now. Great. I've been waiting for this. I have just activated your UV light. Now you can see what a swell shark sees. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, this dive just keeps getting stranger. something I know you'll want to see. When my kids ask me what I do for a living, I tell them that I'm an explorer. I'm an aquanaut and I see things that people have never seen before. I'm a marine biologist. I'm someone who studies the ocean from as many angles as I can. I'm a scientist, an oceanographer, an ocean explorer. It wasn't just that I was meant to be out on ships. I was supposed to be in the bottom. I was supposed to be in the deep water. I was supposed to be doing those things that nobody had ever done before. These sites aren't just salty, they can be violent, characterized by eruptions and incredibly unstable conditions. Every creature has a story, every one, whether you're looking at a little crab or a starfish or a shark. There's something called the immortal jellyfish, aging in reverse. The ocean is Earth's life support system generating most of the oxygen in the atmosphere, capturing much of the carbon dioxide produced by human actions. These animals are sharing this world that might have been millions of years going on in their world. And suddenly, for the first time, we, as humans, are tuning in. The ocean is the planet's living blue heart. Okay, super. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about Beyond? Can you tell us a little bit more about Beyond Blue? What did you What did you set out to do with it, and how do you think it's going? Yeah, it's interesting to, to reference back to Renee's points. We we, we tried to navigate that as well, um, where we wanted we really wanted the game to be beautiful. We wanted you to explore incredible environments. Um, a little bit of the awe and wonder to realize that you know, almost every time these, these divers go on dives, they discover new species, they discover new behaviors, that there's this incredible world under the ocean that we're barely beginning to understand. And it's, it's brain bending, it's spectacular. It's, it's just wild, the things you discover. That was really important so that people would get that feeling that they themselves are, are discovering. But we also wanted to touch on the challenges of science. Science is messy. Science itself is messy. And, and try to make that as interesting, where you have to make decisions, but the decisions aren't obvious. And uh, you play Mirai, a, a marine scientist and explorer, um, but you also have two scientists on a nearby ship. And you have to debate decisions. And actually, the scientists don't always agree. 
because science is messy and these issues are complex. We touch on issues like deep sea mining, which is a very, very complex issue that's being much debated and it's gonna be a bigger issue. We wanted to get this issue on people's radar and thinking about um, uh, why it's important to be informed about how governance is gonna work around deep sea mining. So we do a blend of awe and wonder, but also exploring the messiness and some of the complex decisions. And then we encourage people to get involved with our, 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 uh, the nonprofits that we partnered with, like Mission Blue and Ocean X and the folks that are doing amazing work in the space. Incredible, yeah, no, I've, I've had a chance to play and it's, you know, we would have been proud to have been involved in, in that project. And, and, you know, hopefully you guys are, are very proud of it as well. And, I, you know, I hope that's something that, that kind of continues. I know that you're thinking about, you know, potentially, you know, going further with it. Yeah, one thing that Vanessa said that really struck me when, when you talked about that you've been making these films for 25 or 30 years, it, I, I hope that we can build Beyond Blue for 25 or 30 years because mm. in games, often the, the sequels get better and better and better because it's, it takes a long time to build the technology, to build the tools, to understand the engagement loops, what's working, what's not. We did a bunch of things right, but we also missed some things. So I, I was just imagining as you were talking that if we could run this game as a service for 25 years and optimize it not only for fun and play and engagement, but impact, I actually think it could be world changing. So I mean, it's, it's an intriguing thought. Yeah, and I, I, I know Vanessa would probably be interested in that. I, when, when I heard you speak, Vanessa, last year at, at National Geographic and they asked you at the end of the conversation, what would be your dream project? And you were up there with a couple other filmmakers um, you actually said, I want to develop the first game that takes on environmental and, and, and evolutional, ev evolutionary theory. Um, so wh why, did you, why did you say that? Why was that your dream project and when, why is that important to you? Um, what's been really interesting in, as you say, I've had 30 years to kind of see how our storytelling has evolved. Um, and the thing that I've really noticed is that we try and get the more successful we are at connecting people to nature um, is, is when we're doing things that are immersive, where we're basically taking the audience into the perspective of the animal so that we help them to experience the planet as other animals would do. And it struck me very early on that this, this felt similar to the kinds of games that I watch my young son playing, like Fortnite, where he's just completely immersed in this world. As you said earlier, he takes on an identity of an avatar, whatever it is. And that's what we're actually aspiring to do in our filmmaking is get people to really get inside the experience of those animals. So for me, it feels like it's just the next frontier. It's the next um, way of connecting children particularly young people into our storytelling is instead of trying to bring them into the world that I've been working on for 30 years we need to go onto their platforms and we need to take those kind of immersive techniques which are very similar to what works within the gaming world to help them maybe take on avatars which are animals and play out evolutionary theory which is very similar to gaming theory anyway. I see many of the sort of behaviors that he does within the Fortnite community where he's collaborating, communicating in teams, adopting new behaviors, you know, experiencing different environmental challenges. It's just what animals are experiencing in their own environment and much more rapidly with environmental changing um, situations. So it feels to me that that would be a natural evolution to at least try. And I know as um, Alan was saying, you know, it's a new area, this crossover, and I imagine that these sorts of games must have taken an enormous amount of R&D and we wouldn't get it right. But if we could be given the latitude of, you know, particularly commissioners, maybe saying, OK, do it alongside, really utilise this sort of storytelling, te these huge teams of scientists we work with, conservation mm -hmm. storytellers, pair up with game developers, as you go, so that you're, you've got sort of constant R&D. I mean, we already try and be much more 360 in the way we shoot assets because, you know, we're, we're in locations for long periods of time and we, we capture all sorts of footage, which again could be introduced and unlocked in, in game, as, um, as Alan was saying. So I think it's a really exciting opportunity and risky, high risk, but, you know, we've got to get onto the platforms where young people are if we're really going to um, galvanize change and, and get people feeling motivated and able to do something about the crisis yeah. we're in. 
just on on that point real quick um the platforms was interesting um with with the alaska native game and beyond blue just came out but i imagine it'll be the same with the alaska native game we've had over four million players essentially watch a documentary about the alaska native people on the sony playstation on the xbox on the nintendo on Google and Apple devices. And these are different than PBS or BBC or Netflix. Uh, they're not better or worse, but they're different. And so if you lead with the game and embed the documentaries, you can reach folks on that platform and vice versa on the other platforms. I think it's a very interesting way to look at the ecosystem of at least where we reach people. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing we're really noticing is that the behind the scenes really captures young people's imagination. So people are fascinated with how to be a wildlife filmmaker. And again, that feels like something that could be gamified um, and, and another way in that people could, you know, capture imagery in the same way that you shoot. <laughs> um, it's just capturing footage, um, which plays on very primeval instincts that kids want to do. Um, but in capturing additional footage that maybe isn't in the series, they can be learning about deeper science, bigger conservation issues. So it feels like there's, you know, wonderful opportunity for synergy there. Renee, I have a question Renee. for you. Oh, Just, go, go ahead, Alan, please. Um, you know, you mentioned empathy. Uh, there's, there's really interesting research emerging around when, when you take on, when you become an avatar, whether it's an animal or a marine scientist, there, there's embedded empathy there because you are literally stepping into the character's shoes if it's well-designed and well-realized. Uh, in terms of what you were talking about, about the challenge of empathy in the communication, what do you think in terms of the affordances of games when you can actually step into an animal or a character's shoes? Well, it's an... A incredible opportunity as I also had the experience of partnering with you all with the Internet of Elephants on your game. It was very much oriented around stepping into the shoes of those living in the bush who are on the ground working, um, you know, to protect these creatures. So without question, the empathy piece is key. I just I think it's very, very important. We don't stop there. So that's uh, Vanessa. I really appreciated what you said about you've been watching the evolution over 30 years of storytelling. So I, I've been on a parallel track where we're looking at the evolution of our thinking and understanding of these very complicated challenges. And I see us now, the latest, the latest wave is empathy, right? So it's all about empathy and it's all about evoking empathy and all of that, which is awesome. You know, we need that. And, and we need to go beyond. So it's almost like there was the nature connection, odd wonder, empathy now, and now be, you know, what I think the next frontier is to how do we support players, users, audience, participants in internalizing that ex empathetic experience into what we do out in our respective worlds. And that's where I think there's an opportunity to, uh, in terms of engagement loops you were talking about, Alan, uh, donating, plugging into citizen science, plugging into organizations. The way that if we wanna really help people, partner with people on internalizing the empathy is how do we relate and interact with people in our worlds through conversation, through interaction. So a po potential engagement loop could be, um, or challenge is have a conversation with 10 people in your life about how you're feeling about what's happening with the climate or with this community or with these creatures. Because again, if we look at the neuroscience of how we as humans process information, learn, and then translate that, there's a very identifiable sequence that has to do with the reflection, the internal experience that we have. And then, you know, the, there's a terminology, think, pair, share. So think, reflect, pair ideally with another person where you're having a conversation like we do at every day of our lives where we pick up the phone and we talk to someone and the share, which is how do we actually bring this out into a broader conversation that's happening at the social, cultural, more group level. Um, but I think that that's, that's an, uh, it's sort of an overlooked piece here, which I imagine has been a byproduct of all the, the platforms and projects that you all have been talking about is that people are actually talking, that there are conversations mm. that are happening. And those conversations are vitally important. But let me, uh, there's one element that I think might be missing in that critical loop that I think game designers do 
within their, their sort of entertainment product. And it's often missed, I think, in terms of sort of social change, which is in that loop, first of all, I think the, the individual has to feel like they matter, that they have agency. But crucially, the piece that I often see missing, and this is the, a really important part of game design that gets missed with, quote, gamification and things like that, is that when they act, when they go through that think, pair, share loop, that they're getting feedback that there's, their, their actions are making a difference and that it's making a difference on this larger seeming overwhelming challenge. And I, I think that's one of the most interesting conceptual challenges to how to make, how to put the player in the context within the world and the social community they're engaged with, with the game and, 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 in the, and outside the game where their actions really matter and make a difference. And providing that feedback is one of the hardest things that we're trying to work through. And I, I, I'm curious how that fits into your research. Well, that's, that's it, actually, the, you know, we have a fundamental need as humans to, to have agency and to feel that we have impact. If we perceive, whether it's accurate or not, that our actions will not have the impact that we want, we will disengage, we will withdraw our affect from the, uh, from the issue, and we will channel that affect that effective investment into other areas of our lives where we can have that experience of feedback. That's why people cook, garden, you know, um, and to your point, the gaming context is a simulation of the agency and the feedback that we absolutely critically need. And so the pitfall for folks working in conservation is to want to convey, no, you matter, your impact matters. And that, that message of you matter, your impact matters is in the din of, of profoundly systemic issues that blow our minds in terms of how can we possibly address this, right? Whether it's ivory and elephants or whether it's in Borneo or whether it's the marine life that scientists are now discovering is there. There's this background now of, oh, you know, um, it's, it's all, it's all going down, right? And so we want to fight that with, no, you matter. Donate to this group and do this. And I think that we have to be more sophisticated and more nuanced in the messaging of you matter, which is to acknowledge, to acknowledge you may feel, I think we did this in your game, um, Gautam, you may feel, you might imagine that your impact is not, you know, that you don't have the impact you want. That is that piece that's attunement. And so when we, you acknowledge, you might feel powerless, that allows something in our brains to calm down a bit and to say, yeah, actually I do, I feel so overwhelmed, I feel powerless. We get it, that's why we're here with you right now in this relationship and that's why we are going to, and then you do the redirect and you redirect towards how, you know, what makes sense for you, but you're not bypassing which is a very common pitfall for a lot of us is to bypass that, that place where it's like, but no, here, here's what you can do. You're not, we're not addressing that background of, I just saw something to this morning that just blew my mind and I'm so freaked out about it. The best, the most powerful thing we can do is to empathize in that kind of active attuning way where we're saying, we feel you, we get you. These are natural, normal feelings to have. And, and then you quickly follow that with and join us and you're even engaging in this game is an expression of your humanity and your love for the planet to like continue to reify that, that you being part of this, you're watching this is an expression of something in you. So it's again, kind of drawing attention back to, you know, connecting us with our self-efficacy with the, with the, the desire and the need we have to have impact and, and to just be real with people that, you know, it's going to feel frustrating and it's going to feel difficult at times. That's, that's what excites me as a filmmaker is that by going into the global environment, it feels like you can have a dialogue with the audience and help them and bring to bear all the learning of psychologists, people working with psychologists like yourself, that can help people on that journey. Whereas I'm very conscious and I think, you know, maybe we've been too nervous as filmmakers with our messaging. It's sort of all oh, just tread gently, tread gently. And now it's like, we, we've got to, we can't tread gently anymore. Oh. 
But similarly, the medium, which is just a broadcast medium, effectively, isn't uh, isn't suited to help people actually reconcile the complexity of the the emotions that they're feeling in a in a in a way that they can then channel it and act on it. Which is is what I think I understand from what Alan's saying. The gaming environment could can actually do, and that's why I'm really excited to engage in it. Yeah. Well Two other interesting things, you know, we were working on a civic engagement game actually in the Middle East. It was just an R&D pilot, but it was you were built, you were nurturing a city, you were building a city. City building games are very popular. Farming games are very popular. Uh, but in, in the commercial industry, to advance your city or to get a, a, an, a, an item like a football stadium or soccer stadium, you would often pay a little bit. Since this was a, a, a public interest project, to, to get that stadium, you had to go with a vetted nonprofit, clear a vacant lot, build a soccer pitch for kids, do a mobile check-in, and that would unlock your stadium. So there you're actually building the agency. You're not just messaging agency. You're building the agency into the loops. Very challenging, but rich with potential. I, I want to take another twist on, on, on actually both of your comments. I mean, you mentioned, Renee, the, the doom and gloom. And that that's off-putting. And Vanessa, you mentioned that you lost your audience. What's interesting in games is that's not always the case. There's a game called This War of Mine, where you play a civilian in a war-torn fictional Eastern European uh, country. It's a very rough game. It's, a, it's actually a strategy resource management game, but it's tough. And it was very successful. Um, so interestingly, some of the more scary situations can actually be very inviting context. And you actually play your way out of them to either survive or improve it. Uh, and that raises a larger question that so much of the media, especially, you know, the film, uh, TV, graphic novel and game media is dystopian when, when, mm -hmm. when we look at images of the future, which I think adds to the disengagement. Um, you get a little bit of weird utopian where some reason people wear turtlenecks and everything's white. For some reason, it's a very narrow view of the future. We, we, we don't really have really evocative, aspirational, but achievable visions of the future in, in popular media. And then winding back and saying, what are the stable steps to build them? And that's something we've been thinking a lot about. And they have to be texture, you know, dystopia is often more entertaining when it comes to big movies and stuff like that. But I, I throw that out as a question, which is, how important is it for us to create visions of the future that people aspire to live in and want to and have agency to build the stable steps to urge into existence? Mm -hmm. Well, without question, you know, we need to be, uh, we're motivated by and we're um, inspired by possible vision. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about a psychologist I work with named Leslie Davenport, climate psychologist who uh, addresses this quite a lot in her work, the powerful role of vision, of imagination, of evoking what's possible. She really leans into that. Um, I, in my uh, career, has lean, I've leaned a bit more into the anxiety and the ambivalence, which is we need to create space for, for the anxiety and the conflict and the dilemmas that come up for people. And Leslie, this is why we're great partners, because she also is is acknowledging that we've got to to be able to evoke the aspiration, but not at the cost of acknowledging the anxiety and the ambivalence. So again, we want to keep things as balanced and and resist the profound pull to go from dystopic to utopic. There's something about us as humans we love these dual kind of dualisms or these binaries. How do we have a bit more more nuance to that? Um, but but this is, again, this is all grounded in what's already known and established in the neuroscientific and cognitive uh, research world, which is that we we are pulled forward by vision. But if there's the there's the cynicism, there's the it, it almost seems like cynicism is our is our greatest um, uh, challenge when it comes to that kind of work. I don't know if, if that resonates with you, Alan, but. But I, I think that that's why these games that are dystopic and dark are so compelling is because it feeds into the cynicism. And the cynicism is, is really about pain, right? Cynicism is really about uh, the pain, the pain of feeling that we don't have agency, that we don't have impact. And so then it kind of becomes, it goes underground and it, and it, and it turns into something less constructive. Um, you see, I, I think that we should give people I mean, I get great um, relief from science and actually from understanding nature and biology, because actually there are many more solutions that are happening within nature, within the natural world, where animals 
doing what they've always done are adapting in extraordinary ways. I appreciate there are large numbers of species that are disappearing, but at the same time, they're amazing every single day. We're starting to look at animals in a very different way and see that their, you know, natural selection is messy, evolution is messy. There are individuals that are adapting and, you know, existing in this new and very fast changing environment. And I think if you can help people understand the, the reality of biology and nature and evolutionary principles on this planet, weirdly, there is some relief in that. Um, you don't have to fall into kind of despair or cynicism is I, I believe that nature will find a way and that's why I think for it for a for a, a child to play a game that helps them understand evolutionary principles I think that would be a, a really helpful way to uh, deal with the what's going on in the planet at the moment well one of this this most recent conversation is leading me to this question around there's, so there's one thing, like you said, Alan, may, may, maybe you make a game and it's not fun. Make, maybe you make a game and it's not impactful. But maybe you make a game that's both. But when you need to position it to an audience, um, how important is the impact potential of the game to the audience that you're trying to put it in front of? Is that something I would, I would be curious, you know, how, how Vanessa, you think about that for films and Renee, how you think an audience would think about that. But when I'm seeing a game and I see the advertisement for it, how important is it that I know uh, that this is an, imp you know, a game that's meant for impact or might that actually turn me off because I just think like, oh, no, no, I don't want a game where I'm going to learn or where I got to do something, just give me something fun. How do you, how do you approach that or how have you thought about that in, 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 in the time that you've been working in this space? Yeah, and I think the key is that there, there's no right or wrong answer. There's a lot of different choices and you have to optimize for the choices and the impact goals that the stakeholders want to reach. So for, mm -hmm. for a game like, like Never Alone that we did with our Alaska Native partners, we, we wanted people to come to that game because it looked like a beautiful puzzle platform game that's a genre that people like. Um, and it was clearly bringing a different context and setting. And as they got into it, they really immersed themselves in, in, in the culture. People did not wake up and say, I wanna learn, learn about the Alaska Native culture today. But by the end of the game, they, they really, a world was opened up to them. That's a choice. And, and it's a we're, we're going into a consumer channel, we're competing in the consumer space. We've done, uh, you know, we did a, an educational version of Minecraft called Minecraft EDU, where we actually worked with teachers around curriculum. And their kids knew that this was in school, that this was, that they were learning something, but they were learning something in an entirely different context. The we found that the designers that were good on either of those were completely different. The design methodology was completely different. So I would answer your question more by saying, understand the context, under, you know, one of my favorite uh, definitions of games is an invitation with a contract. And so it's a different invitation when you're choosing to play or buy a, a consumer game versus you're voluntold in school to do something. It's a different invitation. The, the initial engagement loops are just different. So I don't think there's a right or an wrong answer. I think there are different answers. I mean, my feeling is that we have to use every technique that these brilliant game designers are using to pull in your you're hitting audiences that we don't effectively reach uh, with wildlife filmmaking we're very good at the family we're very good at older people but we don't really captivate that sort of teenage to young adult market that that the gaming um, products are so I feel that we have a lot to learn about those hooks you know I think it's remarkable that you could create a game that pull people in to learning about Native Alaskan traditions and culture. I, I don't think if you'd advertised that, you would have got people coming to that. Mm -hmm. And I think whatever those tricks are that you're using, we need to learn them in. And that's why I'm excited to work with game developers, developers, because I think we could learn and take some of those techniques into the way we make the long form documentaries, for example. And similarly, there'll be things that we do that can be taken into the game environment too. Do you, do you think, I think that the Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Alan. Then I'll ask my question after. I, I was going to say, if, if I were to identify the trick um, and, and to use your example of your fascination with sort of biomimicry, bioanalogies, just the uh, what we're learning in nature about so many things, uh, which could be a whole panel unto itself that I think is fascinating. Um, 
what we would try to find, like if we were to tease a game out of that, which we're actually looking at doing, it's finding the organic alignment of those insights that get you really excited and the game mechanics. Mm -hmm. And if that, that organic, that has to be really organic, that alignment. And then, and, and you can't, you can't overlook this. You need great craft. Um, you know, when I was running the studios at Activision, we only had a handful of, of, of creative directors that could lead projects that, that just made, made the magic, that inspired the teams, the lead programmers, the lead game designers, the lead artists, all the different craft people that have to come together to take that core insight and tease it out into a truly inviting, wonderful experience. This is not a commodity, this is a craft. Um, and even when you bring the best craft people, sometimes it works. Sometimes you nurture new people who've never done it before and they create magic, but you can't snap your fingers. However, that organic alignment of wherever the impact is, has to align with the core game mechanics. But, Vanessa, do you think the film sector can be a driving force in, 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 in creating more games and creating uh, more companion uh, uh, products, et cetera, to the films that are being made to, you know, to even shifting? And I'm curious if you've had conversations with other filmmakers and, and you think that some of this might be driven from there or you think that the game sector is really the one that's going to you know to be driving it um i think there's an appetite from uh commissioners and broadcasters and streamers you know everyone is is there's a big surge in interest in natural history uh, filmmaking which is fantastic and I think there's an understanding that you know families really love this material um, and this content um, and I think that they are I mean certainly the conversations we've been having with National Geographic um, there is a, a real sort of and BBC there's an understanding that the, the sort of content that we make works on multiple platforms already we see that um, and it can target those sort of broad, broad audiences that games clearly appeal to as well. So I think because there's a need, um, particularly with the franchise development of, you know, Planet or the Planet franchise and other great franchises that are being created, you need to kind of keep that audience engagement. So I think broadcasters realize that gaming could be a solution. It could work mm -hmm. as an excellent companion to keep people coming back. You know, maybe you launch a series with a game and it works the other way around as Alan, Alan was suggesting. So I, I believe that it could come from the filmmaking side because the conversations are starting to happen. And I think that broadcasters and um, and, and streamers are looking for how we refresh our storytelling and are encouraging us to sort of look at other successful genres and bring that in to the way that we make long form as well. So I'm hoping that we'll get <laughs> a kind of surge of backing to do this. Oh, so am I. Yeah, may maybe there'll be a category at Jackson, uh, at Jackson Wild Film Festival next year for, uh, for games as well. Um, Listen, I, I could listen to you guys talk for, for hours. I'm conscious of uh, time. So I just want to ask one question uh, uh, to all of you. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then unfortunately we'll have to wrap it up. Um, but that question is, is you know, if you could see one game made um, about uh, wildlife or, or, or conservation, you know, what, would it, what would it be? Um, and I will, start with, uh, I will start with Vanessa. <laughs> Well, um, as Galton knows, <laughs> we're working on an idea um, which, you know, I think would be fantastic that's looking at sort of uh, encouraging people to play and, and learn the experience of wildlife filmmaking. And uh, I think that's just a brilliant vehicle for um, a, game, a gamer to learn about the environment, to learn about animals, to learn about conservation and environmental issues. So I'd love to see that game made. Great. Uh, Renee, I know that game making is not your thing, but I'm sure you've got some ideas around like, oh, this could be an amazing game. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I, I would love to see a pl plus one to what Vanessa and Alan have shared. Um, and I would like to see any game collaboration with film really be designed thoughtfully, ideally with some partnership with psychologically oriented and trained people. I'm gonna make a plug for that kind of partnership <laughs> um, because it's kind of a missing piece. And the missing piece is how do we help people process difficult 
um, emotions and difficult experiences that we uh, want to kind of uh, get away from. How can you really help people process? And and we help pro people process through all the ways that we've been talking about, in addition to naming and acknowledging the difficult and um, complicated feelings that people have and encouraging people to have conversations. So building in more conversation based platforms is a, is a big plug I would make. Um, you know, I've mentioned this, um, I've shared this to you all earlier. I have, one of the things that, that Project Inside Out is, has produced are these guiding principles that <clears throat> draw on psychological insights that can, that, that can relate beautifully to anyone working in the sector. And so I'm just gonna name them very quickly, which is a tune. So attuning with your users and your, your participants, your audiences, attuning, revealing, being compassionate storytellers, equipping people with tools and resources to be more effective in the world, um, convening, so really fostering the connectivity, the conversation, and sustain. And sustain is about beyond the film, beyond the launch, beyond the campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, Alan, you said the service model, you know, like that is about sustaining. And so if we were to apply all of those guiding principles into our design and our collaborations between game and film, it would be just massively potent and powerful and game changing, no pun intended. Fantastic. And Alan, I'll ask you the same question. I, I would love to have a game as a service, a construction world building sandbox game uh, where, where millions of, of young folks could actually be be part of building an aspirational but achievable future grounded in, in science using powerful ancient practices, farming, fishing, things that people love, as well as the most amazing advanced technologies in a collaborative way to collectively build and nurture this amazing world that they wanna spend as much time in that world as they mm. would in Minecraft, Fortnite, or, or Roblox. And then as you play the game, you can unlock films about the different pieces uh, that are inspiring the game. It, it has tools to adapt and extend it so people can build extensions. And it becomes a, a movement that bleeds from the virtual into the, into the real world. And as part of that, the, how we look at conservation and wildlife would just be organic to the entire world yeah. ecosystem, yeah. not separate from it. Fantastic. I want to play all of these. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much to, to each of you for joining this. It's been absolutely my privilege to, to be able to be part of this conversation. And, um, you know, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for putting it together. It was a fun, fun conversation. Uh, <laughs>